Okay, guys, let's jump right into it. When will the party end? As goes the Fed, goes the market. Does risk exist if nothing happens? The herd mentality, buy and hold market timing, diversification, and how we do it all differently. You know, people, people say to me, well, I'm highly diversified. We don't diversify. We do not diversify. We hedge. We hedge. Okay, so anyway, let's talk about um, a lot of things have happened. As you guys know, we have a new president. Uh, a lot of things going on globally. The French election was a real toss-up. And of course, uh, the UK is leaving the Union, the European Union. Uh, could that really hurt uh, what's going on in Europe? Of course, North Korea in the news every day. Uh, North Korean president's kind of crazy. I'm not saying our president's crazy. I said North Korea's president's crazy. And then the Middle East, uh, 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 George, uh, George Bush, Trump may decertify the Iran deal this week, so we can see how that unrest might hurt the situation. I'm going to stand over here so you guys, I won't block the, the screen. Okay, let's start with the Fed. As goes the Fed, goes the market. The Federal Reserve, the Federal Reserve, Dennis, as you know, the Federal Reserve, they control short-term interest rates, and they also control the amount of money in the system through what they call monetary, monetary easing or monetary tightening through buying and selling different types of bonds. So Johnny Yellen says over the last 30 days two things. Johnny Yellen said we're going to start reducing our balance sheet in October. That's this month. And we must avoid raising interest rates too slowly. Now these are two separate events. This could be scarier than this. But these are both not positive events for the stock market. Let me explain. Am I speaking slow enough? Okay. <laughs> Start reducing our balance sheet. The Fed balance sheet, in really, probably in, in 08, 09, was probably 800 billion. Today it's 4.2 trillion. When the Fed want, now think about this, Judy. Think about, you have a pool, it's half filled, you fill it up. You have a lot more water in the pool. The way money works in our system, if there's a lot more money in the system, banks are very easy to lend. You get car loans, you get house loans. Uh, you could do, businesses can do a lot of things. And that's, that's when the Fed really opens up the spigot, buys a lot of bonds, and basically floods the, the US with money. We're washed with money. And things are good, and the economy starts to come back, and we recover from this 19, 29 episode we had at the end of 08. And what Bernanke did when he was the head of the federal chair was he took interest rates to nothing, boom, and stimulates everything, right? Now, companies can, can borrow cheap, they could, uh, municipalities could, could expand, uh, very, very inexpensive money. And what she's saying is she's gonna start raising rates and she's gonna start pulling the punch ball. That's what she's saying. Let's look at the facts. These, this chart, what is this chart? For people in the back. Blue line represents when the Fed balance sheet rises. Blue line flattens when the Fed stops expanding the money in circulation. Rise, stop. So what we've seen is expansion and then stop, quantitative easing, one, two, three, and then hold, hold. But you notice when we hold, the market tends to kind of go sideways, except for recently, the market's kind of gone boom. Interesting, now, a lot, of, a lot of smart money says that looks like a bubble. Well, here's what's scary about that. Yellen is, and this is the Fed Reserve source, here's what they're gonna start doing to the balance sheet in October. So this line is gonna start to go this way. Now, so if this is a bubble, when this line goes this way, this could be really a market bubble. A little scary. On top of that, same, same chart, on top of that, this shows historically when the Fed starts to raise rates, it does have somewhat a negative effect on the market. And that's simple. Leroy, think about this. A lot of smart money uh, excuse me, a lot of conservative money, retirees, pensions, endowments, they want to, um, they want to de-risk. They've been in the market, their the portfolio's doing well, they're going, you know, prices are getting pricey. 
Um, maybe I should get out of the market. Well, they go to the banker, CD rates are 1%, money markets are 0 .0. So it forces people to stay invested because you can't grow your money in these fixed incomes. But when the Fed starts raising rates, all of a sudden CDs start paying 2% and 3% and bonds start paying more money. So what happens, Mac, is that the that it starts to compete with the market, with the stock market. And so people say, oh, you know what, I think I'm going to take my profits, come out of the market, and go into fixed income, go into fixed accounts. So that's why when you raise rates, it does eventually start to come into lower stock prices. Dennis, does that make sense? And that's why. I mean, a lot of this stuff does make sense. OK, uh, let's talk about the herd mentality. I love this chart. My trader doesn't like this chart but because it says it's too old, but it shows a point. Money managers and the percentage of, of, of amount of money in cash. Uh, and what's interesting is at the bottom of the market at the dot-com bottom and the bottom of the market in 2009, notice they had the highest levels of cash. Now, Warren Buffett talked about this. Warren Buffett said, when everybody's fearful, I want to be aggressive. When everybody's aggressive, I want to be fearful. So I bet you if I talk to Warren Buffett today, he's probably fearful. He's probably saying, everybody is bullish. Let me show you what I mean. 65% of consumers see the market will keep rising. The last time it was that high, markets didn't do too good. Here's where we are now. OK, so if you believe in the herd mentality. Mac, if you believe that the masses are usually wrong, and Warren Buffett says, whenever he goes one way, I go the other way. Whenever he goes the other way, I go the other way. Now, this is also interesting. This is another Bloomberg chart. And it shows that US household equity holdings to GDP. So what they're saying is the amount of people, Craig, the amount of people that are invested in the market is, is as high as it's been since just before the bubble in 2000. Not a good sign, bearish sign. Another not, not real good, kind of, you know, kind of scary. Now, what's kind of interesting is a lot of people say to me, well, the market's never going to crash again, Sarah, so I don't need to worry about it. I'm just going to go long. CalPERS, number one pension in the United States, CalPERS fund. Billions, billions, I don't know, 50 billion, 75 billion. California teachers, firemen's pension has been firing all the managers that hedge and going long, going ETFs long. That usually happens in a market top because people say, I don't need insurance. I'm never going to get in a car accident, right? Now, does risk exist if you never have a market crash? Well, this was an interesting video. It's actually, you guys might have seen it. It's a video of the, the police, the helicopter police in California warning uh, paddle boarders to get out of the water because there's sharks in the water. And there was a guy with a GoPro and, and it's a fun video, so let's just quickly watch it. The York County Sheriff's Department. Be advised, State Parks is asking us to make an announcement to let you know you are paddleboarding next to approximately 15 great white sharks. <laughs> <laughs> now, this is where you took out the part where he gets eaten? Okay, no. Actually, nothing, no, nothing happened to this gentleman. So is there risk? Don, is there risk if nothing happened? Okay, is this the stock market today? It keeps going up? Do we need to worry about it? So anyway, what, what, the, what do most advisors uh, advise? They say, listen, just put yourself in some good stuff and just hold it for the long term, OK? Buy and hold is probably the most prevalent, or one of the most prevalent, diversify and buy and hold. Um, well, the problem with that concept is, and you can't see this in the back of the room, 
But if I bought the market in 1984, my $100 in real terms would have been worth 400. But if I bought the market in 1954, my $100 in 31 years would have only grown to $20 more. So there's times when buy and hold is great, and there's times when buy and hold is terrible. And that's because there was a lot of volatility in the market from 1954 to 1980s. You see my point. So if you get lucky, Dennis, buy and hold. But it's not a strategy that you can live with because you might not get lucky. Now, if I put that on top of something called valuations. Now, this is an interesting chart. And what it says is simply this. Now, we use the Q ratio, but the Q ratio is like the price to earnings ratio. And Jeanette, all that is, is it tells us if companies are getting a little bit expensive. Um, you know, Apple was 160 bucks a share after they did a four for one split, and then they come out with an iPhone for $1,000. Really? Really? I think I want to short Apple. But anyway, valuations are very high. And the point being is that what this chart says is, OK, they use a Tobin ratio, which is market valuation over total asset value. And what they say is that right now it's 1.15. And they said, OK, let's look at when it was above 1. Now, above 1 means, Leroy, is just when is expensive. Stocks are expensive. Here's what's happened. Over a 20-year period, you would have lost money over, over two of the 20 year periods and slightly been slightly up uh, over other two other periods. But over a 10 year period, that's over 20 years, over a 10 year period, your returns would have been negative in all, all time periods except slightly positive in one. So what confidence do you have right now that the stock market is gonna give you good valuations over the next 20 years when valuations are where they are today. Now, you could ask, Nathan, why is that? Well, because when, when, when markets are toppy, they tend to come down. And if you don't hedge that, that, that risk, you're gonna lose money, then make money, and you end up not making or losing money. And over five years, it looks just as bad. Kendra, how am I doing? Am I speaking too quickly? Okay, she says I'm doing good, okay. So, and I'm slightly positive one period. Okay, okay now, Let's talk about the market timers of the world. Uh, the famous Bill Miller, Bill Miller, Leg Mason, probably the, you know, hail the greatest money manager of all times. Beat the S&P 15 years in a row, was the best market picker, knew how to get in and out. I mean, the guy beat the S&P, he was a god. Until he lost 50% over the next five years, Leg Mason fired him, and now he is, I think he's homeless. No, I'm kidding, he's not homeless but he's no longer working for Lake Mason. Um, Meredith Whitney, the superstar of Goldman Sachs, started her own hedge fund, billion dollar hedge fund. Meredith Whitney basically said, short all your muni bonds after the crash, shorted it, went broke, closed her hedge fund, she's no longer in business. John Paulson, John Paulson, he shorted the subprime crisis. If you watch that movie, uh, The Big Short, he was the one that was uh, working with Goldman Sachs to put together a pool of mortgages to sell it to people and short it because it was such a bad, a bad investment. But he made money. He was on the other side. But he's not doing so well. He's lost 47% in his Advantage Plus hedge fund. And then, of course, we have the greatest bond manager of all time, the greatest uh, Bill Gross. Basically said, sell your treasury bonds four or five years ago. And of course, he was 100% wrong. And he was fired, and now he's working for Janus Capital. Okay, so, so much for market timers, because these guys probably have more PhDs, they have more MBAs than everybody in this room, right? I mean, think about that. They have more brain power. And if these guys, Marty, can't figure out how to get in and out, what, what chance do we have? I just have you, Marty. I don't, I, I, you know. Anyway. Anyway. So, so just talking about, I don't believe in market timing. I just, and, and maybe, maybe if I had a good psychic. Kendra, you have a good psychic, you know? You're, okay. If you had a good psychic, but the truth of matters, if I don't, you know, I don't know. I don't think so. Let's talk about what I really want to spend most of my talk on today is diversification. Because recently I had a client call me up and say, you know, uh, you got a little turned around last year. 
and you just don't diversify enough for me. And my answer wasn't right. I don't diversify because I don't believe diversify is the best way to run money. So let's kind of get into the world of diversification. Developed in 1959 by Dr. Markowitz, Dr. Sharp. Uh, won the Nobel Prize in the 1990s. Um, if you looked at your statement from your advisor, it would look very, very colorful. You could put it on your wall at Christmas time. It's, it's, it has many colors, which represents different assets. The idea is I don't have all my money in one basket, and if something should go bad, the other stuff will do good. The Humpty Dumpty. Well, Humpty Dumpty is, is the wrong example. Um, it's actually the opposite of that. But the point is that we'll be fine. We're diversified. I'm highly diversified. Okay, but let's talk about diversification. And I'm going to use an analogy that I think you'll understand. Okay, I think you'll understand. All right, so you live in Houston. You're concerned about a flood because Houston's been flooding a lot over the last many years. So you decide you want to buy flood insurance. But it's too expensive. It's too expensive. So, and, and I'm using the word here, cost to carry. It's just a high pollutant word of how much something costs to hold to carry, right? Um, it's just how much, if nothing happens, how much do I have to pay to hold this? So insurance can have a high cost. So you can say insurance has a high cost to carry. It's a word plan and advisors use. And that's all it means. Okay, so you decide. Now, I'm going to pick on somebody here, okay, who's not sleeping. Okay, so Dale, I'm going to pick on you, Dale and Sarah. So Dale, um, you, you, guys, you guys have a place in Houston, right? I'm just kidding. I, I know. Yeah. Your, your brother does? Okay, okay. So let's assume you had a place in Houston. You wanted to, you're thinking about blood, but Dale, but you go to Dale, and Dale, you say to Sarah, no, let's just buy stock in Ford. And Sarah says, what? And you say, here's the deal. If the whole city floods, everybody in Texas has a Ford 150. It'll explode the Ford 150 sales and the stock, because that's the highest profit margins of, of the Ford plant, is their 150s. And, 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 and the, the, the rise in Ford stock will offset the flood. Does that make sense? Do you like that idea, Sarah? What do you think? No, seriously. This is a conversation you're having. Do you like that idea? Okay, why not? Very good, very good. You know what, Sarah? You're a brilliant woman. Okay, number one, I need to tell you that. Number two, that what I'm describing right now is exactly what diversification is about. You don't know. You don't know that asset A is going to go up if asset B goes down. You don't know. Yes, you're right. If the whole city floods and 10,000 Ford F-150s have to be bought, yeah, the stock might go up, but then you don't know if it's going to go up enough. Because your house might be down 200 grand, you might be up 10%, 10 grand in your stock. But yeah, but that's what Dale taught you into it, okay? Because you own a Ford one. Does everybody in Texas own a truck? I think so. Have you, has anybody been to Texas? Everybody owns a truck. There's no cars. You're all like looking up at people. You're driving. It's like, hey, you know, I don't know. I don't know. So anyway, so that's the concept. Ford stock could go up if the whole city floods. But Ford stock could lose you money, and if there is a flood, there is no guarantee the Ford stock will offset the damage. Okay, so what I just described to you, this is a chart by J.P. Morgan. I love this chart. Kirk hates this chart because he doesn't understand it. And Kendra, do you understand this after my second talk? You can lie to me. Okay, so I'm going to explain it to you. These, these, these blue lines represent, the, this is the S&P, this is the stock market. So it's basically saying that, that if the market starts to go down, how does you know, the Russell, which is small cap, and the European market, and, and real estate, and uh, the hedge fund index, and emerging markets, and, and high yield bonds, and Japanese and European and municipal bonds. So you can see that the idea is it shows you the matrix of how different, different assets Ford stock has related to a flood in, in Houston. But here's the problem. When there's a real crash, a, a really big crash is represented by the axis. But notice that when there's a big crash, 
all the X's kind of spike up. Something that's kind of going to give you some diversification loses diversification. And that's what the X's represent. OK, do you see that? Now, all the way on this side of the chart is some stuff that really does a good job of going up. This represents a down market. This represents an up market. So like the best one on this chart is S&P puts, which is really just straight flood insurance, not Ford stock. Because if the, S if the market crashes, I know that my insurance is going to pay off. That's the best thing on the chart. Everything else is sort of uh, in here is all Ford stock. Does that make sense to everybody? OK. Now, this guy right here is actually the 20-year bond, the long bond. Right here is the long bond. And that's why a lot of people hedge with the long bond. Um, that's why the most popular mix that most advisors use is 60% stock and 40% bonds. And that has to do with Dr. Markowitz and Dr. Sharp's work that won the Nobel Prize about diversification. But, that's, but the problem is that still lost half your money in 2008. That had a 50 beta, 0.50 beta, which means it lost about half your money. So a 60-40 mix would have lost you, if the market was down 57, Dennis, you'd have been in down about 30, a little less than 30. And, that, and that's, if that's OK, then that's OK. The problem with the 60-40 mix, though, it has an upside capture ratio long term of 44%. So you lose, you make less on the upside, you lose more on the downside. I don't like that. That's a negative skewed asset. That's, that's, I, I want to make more on the upside and I want to lose less. I don't want it flipped. But anyway, 60-40 uh, has been doing better lately. But anyway, that's the idea. If stocks go down, bonds go up. Okay. But there's times when stocks do go up when bonds go down, like 2011. But stocks and bonds have been rising together lately. And if they keep rising together, are they going to fall together? Well, <clears throat> let me slow down, Kendra. Bonds, and, bonds have been going up since Paul Volcker went to Jimmy Carter in 1981 and said, Mr. President, we need to lower interest rates. I mean, we need to rise interest rates because inflation is just going crazy. So Jimmy Carter said, OK, and, and interest rates were at 15%. Remember that, Dennis? Do you remember that? I mean, anybody that owned a home in the early 80s, you were paying 15%. Donna, you remember that? Or a farm. Or a farm. OK. No, oh, yeah. Did you have a farm? Oh, uh, yes, I did. Well, then you didn't. OK. Yeah, I'll bet. Well, it was not a good time. I remember I was on Wall Street at this time, and we were selling 30-year 30 30 year, uh, treasuries for 15%, and they were coupon. Yeah. Could you imagine? And I couldn't sell them. You know why I couldn't sell them? Because my people I was calling said interest rates are even going higher. Oh, yeah. And I couldn't get out of them. But yeah, anyway, since then, interest rates have been falling and bonds have been rising. So we've been in a bull market in bonds. But with Janet Yellen saying she's going to start raising rates as interest rates rise, bonds go the other way. They go down. So what happens when you combine an eight-year good market, bull market, with historically low interest rates and a view the feds will raise rates soon. You get a lot of people concerned that stocks and bonds might both fall together. The big concern lately is how will investors react to stocks falling and see their bond portfolio fall also. That's scary. So again, this is diversification. This is what 99% of advisors tell you. So why did Warren Buffett say this? Why diversification is only required when investors do not understand what they are doing. So, so the, great, the, the great oracle is saying, don't diversify. Now, he understands a couple of things. He understands that diversification really breaks down when markets get really bad. 08, 2000, uh, 87, God knows, 2018, uh, a war with North Korea. Diversification is not going to work. And for me to invest your life savings in a program that says, oh, it should work, or maybe I should get you out because I don't know it will work, is not an investment strategy. So at, at D, I teach at DU, and I teach all different types of risk. 
And I say, you know, risk diversification works great if you, if you want to build a portfolio, a million dollar portfolio of high yield bonds. So what you do is you buy $1,000 of Rite Aid and buy a $1,000 bond of Kroger and buy a $1,000 bond of, of Burger King and yada yada because you're figuring the only way you can not get your money back is if a company like American Airlines should go bankrupt. But then it came back. So yes, di diversification works with default risk, but it doesn't work very well with market risk or systematic risk. We call that undiversifiable risk. According to Investopedia, and let me read this to everybody. This is right uh, off the internet. The risk inherent to the entire market or entire market segment. Systematic risk, also known as undiversifiable risk, market risk, or volatility, affects the overall market, not just a particular stock or industry. This type of risk is both unpredictable and impossible to completely avoid. It cannot be mitigated through diversification, only through hedging. Okay, there it is. There it is. You know, Dr. Bernanke, it's interesting because people say, well, could only markets have systematic events, only st equities? No. In, in, uh, in 2008, in 2008, we had a systematic event, not only in the stock market, in another market. And here's what's interesting. The head of the Federal Reserve in 2008 was Dr. Ben Bernanke. And he was interviewed by CNBC, Maria Bartiromo in 2005. And Maria Bartiromo asked him, could we have a systematic event in the mortgage industry? Here's what he said. Hey, what is the worst case Okay, in that, in that interesting. Dr. Bernanke was 100% wrong. Um, yeah, it's never happened before, but it happened. Now, it's interesting. With our structured notes, and as some of the people in this room have our, our structured programs, our, 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 port, our portfolio growth program, protected growth program, um, we actually don't put our bonds in one industry. Remember, if you were in all mortgages, you got killed and there was a massive default. So, so what you could say is, well, I could have had bonds in different industry groups, and then those things wouldn't have gone to zero. Anyway, that's getting back to diversification and, and what you can diversify. So anyway, since 2000, really since, uh, since the 50s and, and the 1990s, there's been a lot of improvements to diversification. A lot of improvements. In other words, diversification, Judy, is not something that was invented in 1959. And by the way, they call that modern portfolio theory. 1959. What they did was they actually came up with um, a lot of smart people and a lot of PhDs and Nobel laureates came up with improvements on diversification models. But, you know, and, and, and Marty, you could speak to Garsh, right? Garsh just doesn't, it's, you can't predict those, those inputs, right? So bottom line is that um, I teach all this at the university, and then I tell my students, you know, it really doesn't work real well. And the reason is, is because with all these advances, you still saw portfolios get majorly destroyed, pensions, endowments, public pensions, Lost, I mean, you're talking 50% of their value. Uh, private pensions, 401ks get decimated in 08. You know, so what we've come to is the Financial Times is saying 
maybe portfolio theory diversification just is not a good way to run money. Well, it didn't take me a long, after my 35 years doing this crazy business, to realize I've got to run money better because I'm not going to put people's life savings into something that might or might not work. So let's get back to the Fords. You got the Fords, okay. Sarah, you're not feeling too good about the Fords. But how much money did you put into the Ford stock, by the way? 100 grand? I don't know. Your house is worth, what, 500? 100 grand, maybe? OK. So first of all, will the flood ruin the car, all the cars? Is the flood big enough to affect the stock price? If the market crashes, would the Ford stock go up? Because stocks tend to be, it's a stock market, not a market of stocks. How much will Ford stock rise? Will the stock cover the damage? Owning another asset could increase your risk because the Ford stock could lose money and you could have a flood. Then you're screwed on both sides. <laughs> Cross asset hedging doesn't always work. So anyway, guess what happens? Hurricane hits Houston, Houston floods out and Ford stock does pretty well. Wow, son of a gun. Guess what happened? Everybody in Houston needs to buy a Ford F-150. But Ford stock went up 10%. So your 100,000 in stock went up 10 grand, but your flood's 200 grand. So yeah, did it cover your risk? Now, this worked, but it didn't work. I mean, that, this is, this is diver I am explaining to you how ridiculous this is. This is diversification. This is what everybody does. It's stupid, but people do it. So anyway, how are we different? Well, we own straight insurance. OK, you're going to tell them thanks, Kendra. We own straight insurance. We own insurance. We own flood insurance. Mac, we don't own poor stock. We own flood insurance. We're paying for flood. We own long puts. And I could define my risk mathematically almost perfectly. There's no, so a diversified model, which depends on assets not coming together and crashing together, because we own the one thing on this chart that is insurance. That's what we own. We own an SPX put. Now, let's take a look at so far this year. We're up 7.64 at the end of the quarter. We're up about another 1% since then. Our stock is, uh, what's our fund trading? 10 what? You're fired. You just, you just lost 4%. So we're, up 10, so we're up another 1% since the end of the quarter. Um, but, but, you know, we're capturing about 60% this year. You know, even with our egg, our goose egg, I mean, our, you know, last year, as everybody knows, we were using VIX to hedge, and it kind of got us a little sideways. We had a bit of a donut hole. And it's interesting because I published a white paper, and then the VIX started to underperform. Now, I don't think that I caused the VIX to underperform. But a lot of my friends say, don't publish any more white papers. <laughs> but um, it was published in the Journal of Investment Consulting. I'm very excited about that. But the fact of the matter is, even with our goose egg, because we were using this guy. And this guy is not as good as this guy. This is like high deductible insurance. So the VIX is the second best thing to hedge other than the SPX. But it's more expensive. So we took out VIX. We put in SPX. But we, even though, if you, even though with our, our flat, a situation that we, we gave back some stuff last year. Um, if you look at 15, 16, and 17, we're still capturing 64% of the market, which is better than a 60, 40 anyway. 60, 40 since 2011, um, since we started our fund, um, is only capturing 62% of the upside. We're doing better than that over the long term. But let's look at a couple things. A couple of things are starting to happen. August and September, um, we're actually doing better than our historical average on our upside capture ratio. We're capturing, in this case, we were up 66 basis points in August. The market was only up 0.05. September, we were up 1.85. The market was up 1.93, just barely beat me. And this month, we're pretty much um, capturing about 80% of the upside. Why? What's going on? Why is our downside drawdowns actually becoming less and less? That's interesting, because if you look at our strategy this year, over the last several months, 
this is the drawdowns. We're actually, our drawdowns are really starting to improve. And there's, it's not, there's a reason for this. And the reason is really exciting. With the work of Dr. Mahdi and, uh, and my great trader and, and working as a team, we're able to add structures to the portfolio that really are reducing our drawdowns, not only at the, at the edges, but even at the fringes. So even on the, on the little drawdowns, the, the, the half a point or a third of a point, the other day the market was down 40 beats, we were flat. And that's some of these structures, like these, some of these short-term put diagonals we're putting on, which really are very low cost, but have high asymmetry. So we're really continuing to do this. Add insurance, but not hurt our upside. Because insurance, guys, is a cost. Yeah, it's a cost. You, you, you don't buy insurance for free. There's a hard cost to it. And that's why most planners, most money managers, most portfolio managers don't use puts. It's too expensive. And I talk to a lot of advisors. They go, no, I don't use it. I just can't afford it. I can't afford to pay 12% a year to manage my port hedge my portfolio. If the market crashes, I'm great. But if the market goes up, I'm up 12, I'm flat. If the market's flat, I'm down 12. The cost to carry insurance is off the chain. But through a lot of hard work and through really um, working with the best and the brightest, we're able to really figure out how to hold insurance and reduce the cost, reduce the carry. Does that make sense, Lorna? Lorna, are you understanding my talk today? I'm excited about that. I'm very excited about that. Because I know sometimes you guys don't understand what I talk about. Most of the time you don't understand what I'm talking about. All the time you don't understand what I'm talking about. But then either the, the advisors I talk to, so it's not just you. So anyway, you know, the IPS is simply this. You can't predict when there's going to be a tornado. You can't predict, God forbid, you get in a car today and you get in a crash. You can't predict when the next hurricane is going to hit Florida. You, you, you can't predict when the next flood. And, and the best money managers can't predict when the next crash is coming. So our attitude is simply this. If you can't predict when the market's going to crash, you buy what? You buy a Ford F-150. <laughs> no, you buy insurance. You buy insurance. And, 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 and the point is, is that that's our, our attitude is, I get so many people come up to me in, 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 you know, all the time. What do you do? Oh, yeah, what should I do? The market, blah, blah. I'm, I always want to be invested because I can't afford, your money cannot afford to grow at 0%. You have inflation, right, Diane? You have taxes. You want, you, be able, you want to live as good or better than you're living today. That's pretty much what you want to do. So our attitude is if we can always be invested, but always have insurance. You're going to not drive. You're not going to drive because all right, I'm not going to have insurance this month. Well, then I'm not going to drive. Well, I'm going to stay at home. No, you always drive, right? You always drive, but you always have insurance, right? And, and, and we always invest, but we're always fully insured. And we are. We have, we're long volatility, we have long downside tails. What that means, if the market crashes, when Brexit happened, the market was down 4%, we were up 1.9. Because the back end of the curve exploded, that means the volatility curve, we're long vol, it exploded and all my long push just paid off big. 